said to Ronnie. Okay. Um, the introduction to give you a bit of an idea. Um, this will help a bit more. So I have an interest in snakes for a long time. Uh, why? I don't know. Maybe others in the room with uh, similar interests, and they can't pin it down either. Why they are They are fascinating animals for a variety of reasons, uh, not just the, of their form, the way they move, the colour, where they live, the fact that uh, from ancient times you're able to kill someone with virtually no wounds, whether it's an animal or a human. Uh, there are so many things about snakes that are fascinating. And one of the most fascinating aspects that for me makes it so interesting and hard to understand is their interaction with another animal, the most prolific one on earth. And that's you. Humans and snakes. And there's all sorts of reasons why we interact. Most of the animals on the earth, snakes, you can see this from there, they are all the natural snakes of the cobra like family related directly to, uh, from a family point of view, the mammals of Africa, the crates of Asia, the coral snakes of the Americas, so the Australian venomous land snakes, and the marine snakes of the family of Africa. The photograph was made taken in about 1986, when I caught a coastal taipan uh, in a house in Adelaide, after it had been a person and in the house. So personal. Uh, I've been trying to put some of my thoughts out of my head out there for people to have a better understanding of snakes uh, by a couple of publications or be self-published uh, because I believe, and that's the reason why I'm here today, that humans around the world, we can't live without snakes. And I have a feeling that I need to help people understand the snakes so that you too and others can also see that. That there are so many things about snakes that are valuable to humankind. As in the introduction, I've been working with training courses and educational sessions for a long time. There's some figures there, give you a bit of an idea. It is throughout Australia. My first overseas sojourn was to Pakistan for a mining company, uh, then to New Zealand. The, no the native land snakes of New Zealand, they do have sea snakes, so they are not snake free. But of course, also an earlier trip to Nepal, where I had the great fortune of meeting Dr. Tapa uh, in the Japan. So for those of you who don't know Oz very well, the colloquialism for Australia, um, I come from this area down here, where today in Adelaide it's probably around about 14 degrees, uh, but quite low humidity, which is a little bit different from here. So the, the scars are where I've done the other work before, as you probably realise. I, I intend to pose a few questions to you. We're talking about snakes of value. Why are they valued? Uh, and one of the first things that comes to mind for me, and without thinking of snakes, but of anything at all, what is value? What is something that's of value? Are we talking about monetary value? Are we talking of scientific value? <coughs> is it something of value to the veterinary profession? So value has got a very broad context. I tend to just look at the narrow area of our snakes. Um, if you think something is valuable to you, whether it's a camera like this cannon, or the clothes on your back, or the food you eat, how do you define that it is valuable? Is it only valuable to you? Is it valuable to others in your society? Is it valuable to the nation? This is where, again, we can look at snakes and think, well, they aren't just valuable to individuals, they do have, in some respects, a national value. And we look at that as I proceed. They can be valuable as food, a program that uh, Ted Pandy is proposing in regard to bush meat. 
In some areas uh, of the world, they're valuable for their leathers, so particularly poisonous, and some of the larger venomous snakes. Uh, in parts of the world, such as Southeast Asia, they're valuable for the pet industry, the pet trade. They get caught and shipped overseas to Europe or North America, many times in not good conditions. They are also, and this is where the national part comes in, they are valuable for a balanced environment. Without snakes in this part of the world, whether they're problems or others, if you have issues with rodents eating your food stores, you can lay out poisons if you wish to, but by far the most valuable creature, animal, to control the pest animals is a snake. But why do some people value snakes over some snakes over others? Some people will be prepared to put a value to understand why pythons are useful. But not, on the other hand, why a cobra or a prey or a grasshopper survivor are valuable. But as we'll see, they also have value. So initially all I'm going to do is skip through a few nice pretty pictures to put it in context for you. Initially, it's looking at um, the four groups of medically important uh, venomous snakes of the world. So the first one are the Aphrodaspids, the stiletto or mold snakes from uh, Africa through to the Middle East, given that name because of the structure of their fangs. It sticks out the side of the mouth even when the mouth is closed. And if you move through a burrow to try and secure your food, again you can see relatively small eyes. If you come across something you want to eat, you may not have the space to open your mouth wide and bite it. So you just poke the thing out the side of your mouth and stab the creature as you're going. And herpetologists have come to grief by, and been bitten by these creatures when you hold them in a traditional way, end up being stabbed in a thumb, for instance. The calibri, which is a bit of a mishmash of snakes of the well, now being called in non front fang calibroid snakes, a bit of a mouthful, include many that are medically important from Africa and Asia in particular, such as in the <laughs> photograph of the bull slang of South Africa. And it wasn't until the 1950s that they were actually found to be dangerously venomous. These are the back fang snakes of the world, fangs towards the rear of the mouth behind the eyes mostly. Some of the Asian snakes, some of the killbacks, uh, particularly from Eastern Asia, are also dangerous, such as the tiger killback. Uh, the third group are the vipers, which are found throughout the world, where they are true vipers like the European adder in the left photograph, or the rattlesnakes of the Americas. They're found everywhere except what country of the world doesn't have vipers? No comments from a mod or dead. What country of the world does not have vipers? We don't have white. What we've got are these snakes. So if you know that one, you may not know this one. The one on the left is an eastern brown snake. When they get uptight, aggrieved, um, nervous, and so on, they lift the forefoot off the ground. Not as spectacularly as a cobra, but nevertheless, flatten the neck out and lift it up. So, cobra-like snakes are our adapted snakes of Australia. They are a problem in the minds of people. Many people, most people, not so much for me. In rural areas where there's country Australia, rural Nepal, they can be a problem for humans because they get inside the house and over the crates and bite someone, perhaps in their sleep, Crack bite like a brown snake bite tends to be painless. Minimal um, injury at the bite site. That can cause respiratory para paralysis. So the person needs to be kept alive until the effects of the venom wear off, as you can see in the photo. Now, pets too can be bit, probably notably Australian, and they are many thousands of them every year. So deadly dogs and cats. Uh, also stop. Um, the ones that would be most at risk would be goats, sheep, cattle and horses. 
and even a large animal like a horse we found with our snakes, and these particularly tiger snakes, they can be very susceptible to snake venom. So, the photograph here is of a person's hand. He was bitten by one of our mulga snakes, which is one of the large Australian snakes. And this is, this is an exception. Uh, this is where some of our snakes, even though they are anaplets, the effects can be very close to that of a viper. Because he was bitten, believe it or not, nine times on the hand. And you can see some of the holes. He was a large snake. He was drunk at the time, not a good combination, straight away. Bought the snake. Then decided he wanted to hang on. Put his hand with the snake into a plastic bag. Let it go. Put his hand back in the bag again after being bitten once. And he was bitten another eight times. So he was bitten nine times. Mild snakes produce a huge amount of venom, more so than a cobra. So nine lots of very large quantity of venom. His hand started to dissolve due to the properties of mild snake venom. The only one that could save his life was to cut his arm. It's a bit extreme. So, snakes can be an occupational hazard for farmers working in the fields, and one of the reasons why is what? Why are they a problem for perhaps a rice farmer? One of the, the most obvious reasons, what is it? It's hot like today, it's humid, you're outside, you've got a hat on, but you're working in a wet field. What's the most comfortable way to do your work? Bare feet. So you step on a rifle or something out there. You've got no protection between the snake's fangs to deliver the venom and your skin. Uh, and many people are bitten that way. So it's a particular hazard for some workers like that that may, by the situation of where they're working, be at risk. Snake handers throughout the world, not just uh, any in the heat of southern uh, Asia, where it's here, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, wherever, um, can be at risk because uh, of the frequency of when they work with snakes. And it's similar, becoming increasingly an issue in Australia. More people want to catch snakes, but they tend to do it because they think they're going to become millionaires by catching snakes. But it tends to be very seasonal. That bite is from a tiger snake, one of the notorious Australian snakes. This one is particularly relevant. It's a bite from a brown snake. How many people here know much about snake bite, apart from Dr. Tepper uh, and uh, a monitor of that? How many people have a knowledge of, brown, uh, of snake bite? Anyone else? Do you know what a crate bite looks like? That's what it means, please. Would it look like a in any way similar to that? Yes, it's significant. Painless. No bruising, no riddling, no swilling. So similarly, we've got snakes from Australia that are very much the same as snakes of Nepal, in this part of the world, in the effects they have. It isn't just what it looks like in the event. What happens to the person as well? So there is a close parallel between your country and my country. So a quick couple of photographs of Australian snakes. That's the round snake I'm talking about. They are uh, young local taipans. You may have heard of taipans. Um, and if you're feeling really keen, like a fellow with a mole snake, you go over and you go jiggle, 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 jiggle. You think you get bitten? <laughs> well, how many snakes, how many heads can you see in there? That do a good job of you, I'm sure. Okay. Does that remind you of a local snake at all? What might it be? Burmese python, perhaps. Mm. No, it flares its body out when it's alarmed like this. Again, you can understand perhaps why they tend to be called overseas at least the cobra-like snakes. Tigers. Now, this is going to confuse you. It's called a death adder. But it's not a viper. It's convergent evolution. It's related to the other Australian snakes. It's not an adder. 
Now, it gets even more confusing because it has a head like an adder, a body shape like an adder, behaviour like an adder, and even with the fangs, which are quite large for the size of its head, which are very mobile. Now, you know, or at least some of you know, how mobile viper fangs are. So, too, are they with the head adder, unlike any of the other Australian snakes. Dev Pandy will talk about the venoms in a while, and that's one that's interesting because it has postsynaptic neurotoxins, which can be readily reversed the effects by anti venom. Most of the other Australian snakes can't. Ridley black snakes are common ones in southern Australia. That's the mulga snake I mentioned, found throughout Australia, the most widespread snake. Very large, can get up to probably about three metres in size, and that's approaching copper size. Now, looking at some of the snakes from southern parts of Asia, just to give you a comparison, so I've talked about the effects of perhaps a brown snake might compared to a crate bite. Um, Ed will talk about uh, the effects of the copper bite when he uh, gets to it. So what we're looking at here is the, the big four. Australia doesn't have something equivalent. Uh, these are the, the big four uh, snakes of southern parts of Asia. And then the rusty viper. Uh, notoriously the effects. Uh, and lastly, the source code viper, which may not be found in uh, the fall, but not that far away, countries nearby. Okay, now let's get down, down to the nitty gritty of white snakes. And I'm looking at venomous snakes in particular. I haven't uh, aimed at that type into other snakes for time constraints, looking at venomous snakes. And after all, that's my particular interest. And obvious what I've mentioned already is how much they can control pest animals around farms, towns, cities and so on. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, whether it's South Africa, whether it's Europe, whether it's somewhere in the Americas, here or Australia. Where there are mice and rats, house mice, black rats, brown rats, if there are snakes, they will help you control them. So you can get past the idea of I don't like snakes, and at least learn to live with a snake that's in your vicinity, you'll go a long way to be able to uh, live with them and find that they are valuable after all. Venom has been used for quite a few decades now, research purposes, production of pharmaceuticals and so on. Some have been uh, in the marketplace uh, at Capricorn. The medical people here want to know that for us. The 1960s. So, no, I've got below. Yeah, that photograph is an interesting one. You think, well, I could use a word for that fellow, but there are ladies present, so I won't. <laughs> you see what he's doing? In the photograph, what you can see there are tiger snakes, red bellied blacks, brown snakes, maybe a few pythons. Most of them are venomous. He's hanging them around his neck, he's got them around his feet. These are the old snake um, catchers and, and uh, fellas from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. What he's actually doing is twofold. One, he's caught these snakes to use as a spectacle to try and uh, get people in uh, because he's a show. They'll pay him uh, two shillings or whatever so they can see inside his tent all of these snakes there uh, and he, he makes a living. The other thing he does is collect these snakes, notably tiger snakes and brown snakes, and he sells the venom to an institution that produces the anti venom and that's how they did it originally, why people like this. So that's the, the important of the photograph. So it's used for the production of anti venom in Australia for not just humans, but also for animals, from a veterinary point of view. There are now a number of specific veterinary anti venoms. In the past, perhaps 15 or so years ago, they used to use out of date human anti venoms, but no longer. Are there any venoms available in India or Nepal or this part of the world for animals? The pet can stop. Are this? Yes? Same, same, same. Same composition is used. <laughs> okay, uh, then I had a discussion at lunch. Over the three, 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 three,
you know, then I'm Venom has been used as a green for a very long time. Over 2,000 years. Now, whether the Romans used it for a value on snakes, and particular venomous snakes, it's not a second part of it. It's not a second part of it. It's me. Venomous snakes and I had to work with ice and tricks. 20 minutes was it even. My job would be much more and more boring. Much more boring anyway. Because what we do, and I did it only recently, the week before I came to Nepal, we had a display in Adelaide, and I had a snake pit 4 metres by 4 metres, so about that size. We put a selection of brown snakes, black snakes and tiger snakes inside the pit, then what did we do? We invited the public and we stood in the pit with the snakes. Now I wasn't wearing thongs or sandals or whatever, I had boots on. But have a think about it. If you're, you're visiting this display for another reason, you come along and you see someone standing in a pit of snakes, would you or would you not be attracted to come and have a look? You might go there and think, this is an idiot! He's going to be bitten by snakes. I want to see that. Or you might have a genuine question as to, well, I've got a snake in my backyard. Maybe one of these people can tell me about it. So it's an attraction. And it gives us the chance to talk with these people and to educate them. But if they were pythons and they were just draped around someone's neck, you see it all the time. Most of you are young people. How many of you have a computer? Your phone is a computer. Only one hand. Every single person in this room has a computer. How many of you have a computer in your own? No, on your person. That's a computer. Okay? You've all got one, haven't you? This gentleman here has one. I've got one. Okay. Right. <laughs> your computer is an aspect of your technology. Right, we have, we have a spectrum with young people today. We are all addressing all of these, not the old people. So you can go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Now thank you for a second. Then you think about your computer. Ah, look, I've got one honest person here. You know, I probably couldn't either. It's very useful. Okay, so what I'm suggesting is, perhaps when I was your age, we didn't have computers, we didn't even have mobile phones, and we'd get out more. We'd get out into the bushes here. We'd go down the road to the river and muck around down there. We were more involved with the wildlife. Are you? <laughs> no. You might pick your phone up and Google something if you want to know it. Oh yes, I want to know about Eastern Brown Snakes. You get the information, you won't get the experience. So, what I'm looking at here is to try and find a balance. So somewhere along that line between technology and natural environment, how can I draw you, even for a short while, away from your technology towards getting more involved, more engaged in the real world where our wildlife is. That's my challenge. And maybe that's why I'm here today. I think you can all understand the importance of whether it's snakes, lizards, mongooses, vultures, in a stable ecological diversity. So I probably don't have to dwell on that one at all. That's a red bellied black snake. With a close-up photograph with a little bit of water on it. You could probably make a, a, a sort of wall hanging out of that or something because it looks uh, really quite stunning. This is an early photograph of some kids with a python trying to educate them not to be frightened of snakes. And, and this is a photograph that was taken yesterday because this a man there when he went to a couple of schools. So so there are a number of other aspects of this which are important, and particularly for you rather than for us in Australia, where you don't have the, the deep cultural aspect of your lives, and that's the religious values of some animals, such as the cultures. 
Okay, now I'm going to throw one at you which you're going to have to think about. And it's this one. I want to make a comparison between demons and snakes. To see if you can follow me. Now, is there anyone here who's really got to take this? And the fellow over there, I can't include him, so I'll probably do. What does a DNO in relation to animals? Acronym. What does it mean? Vomero nasal organ. Okay. Now, do snakes have them? Yes. Yeah. How do they use Yes, we could take off some organ just to amru you or can I get a woman as a local man. The tongue, So that is the reason for the snake having a fork tongue, because it's a stereo organ, it has direction, pokes it out in the air, the ground, collects chemicals, pheromones, whatever from the environment, draws it into the mouth, passes those particles, chemicals, to this organ in the roof of the mouth. It's independent of smell, it's not connected to smell. It's a separate sense. On my nasal organ. They're highly acute in snakes. Okay? Well, Jacob's involved in the main bird. What's it got to do with you? Well, some decades ago, it was thought that humans, as an embryo, had a bone my nasal organ. But as you developed and become born and start to grow, that would be that part, and it was of no use. In the last couple of decades, it's been suggested that we still have. Now have a think about it. Let's give you a scenario. You've met someone for the very first time. You've never seen them before. Last slide today, I see. Yes. Something about them. Something about them. Something about them. Something about them. You engage with them straight away. You can speak easily with them. But it's male or female as a relevant. But there's something about them that just seems to click with you. Have you ever met anyone like that? Perhaps? My hair's not. If you believe that, then that's an explanation for the wrong nasal organ. Because we all produce pheromones through our skin. We shed billions of skin scales a day. And in your immediate environment, when you come close to someone, you could perhaps are picking up those pheromones. They're not activating your wrong nasal organ. Have a think about it. Do some googling <laughs> and see what comes up. Uh, and if I'm wrong, let me know. Uh, another one out of body here. So that's the another aspect of which is very interesting is trying to understand human phobias. What's the phobia that relates to snakes? Anyone know? Snakes are a video. Well, it looks like it's a video Do you know anyone who's terrified of snakes? You can't even look at a photograph. Mo most of them, please. Oh. Most of them, please. Is there someone who has a video <laughs> in this room? And the answer is no. Because you have such a fear, you could not even look at the photo of a snake. Okay? So you, you might be fearful, not real sure about them, but you don't have a photo because you are here. So that's another aspect of what I do, to try and help people understand snakes so that they can see the value of them, understand where they fit into a natural ecosystem, uh, and help them to live a better life as a consequence. Whether these actually are found here or not, this is a, a slide that I put together when I went to Pakistan. It looked a bit interesting, so I thought I'd include it. Um, because uh, there are myths about snakes all over the world, not just in this part of the world, Australia too. Huh? So the uh, sand pile in the top photograph. Two mouths, pick over one mouth six months and then close and then they use the other one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not true, of course. They've got one mouth and the other end they've got to blow out. But because their shape is so uniform, it's easy to make that mistake. Alright? The second one there, one of the Caribbean snakes. They live in voice active at night, staying away from the sand, but uh, roll themselves, what does that mean? Is it took into a hoop, the way you go, and the so-called hoop snake? Does it exist? So these are myths uh, carried on over generations and uh, many, many hundreds of years.
I also so have the history of what happens in that one. Paradoxes. You can actually help other people to understand the their sphere and have an understanding of just how valuable they are in your society. Another one. Snakes, thinking about the snakes, can be useful for someone to have employment. On here. That's how I get my money when I work in Australia. Teach people about snakes, training courses, etc. They pay handsomely for it. Not every day, but enough. Okay? I don't need one anymore. I'm sort of getting on in years. Um, people with patch snakes are very spicy. That's a, another type hand. Venom supplies in South Australia. So I did a number of other business opportunities too. So, sale of venom, production of anti venom, um, snake products in some parts of the world. There's aid kits like this one, which can then be sold around the world. Uh, catching snakes, training people, what I do. Okay. Then on that note, I'll finish. Thank you all for your attention.